for coming. Thanks, Melissa, for inviting me. Thank you to my students who have come. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to read um, some sort of smushed together chapters from my novel, The Something, Somewhere Something Animal. Um, and really briefly, it's about um, an English family who go to South Africa, apartheid era South Africa, to start an ostrich farm. Um, and most particularly, it's about the girl who is 10 years old and her friendship with two people, one an Afrikaans girl named Marika, and which I've just, Gary taught me how to pronounce properly today, and um, <laughs> um, the other a little Koza boy, a little um, African boy named Sifa. Um, so I'm just going to read now. Um, <laughs> Uh, to get down to the riverbed after the rain, we had to cut through the newly sprouted undergrowth with spades that Marika had snicked from her father's tool shed. By the time we got to the bottom, we were both sweating and covered in dirt. We sat down on a rock to get our breath back, and I told Marika about the buffalo and the beating heart in the grass that followed us home. If I hadn't led us away, we would have been crushed like pepper, I said, borrowing Sifo's phrase. Yeah, probably, said Marika. Do you think it was the night spirits I heard, I said, desperate to impress Marika? Nah, she said. What are you doing running around with Sifo all the time anyway? It's not right, I keep telling you that. I'm not running around with him, I said, embarrassed. I'm his babysitter. A fine babysitter you are, said Marika, dragging him into, out into a herd of buffalo. It wasn't like that, I said. Marika shrugged. I'm just messing. Marika had a way with playing games with words, and I never felt quite on equal footing with her. I didn't even like her sometimes. I needed her, though, to keep the days sharply burning, to keep them fierce. I stood up and walked a little way up the riverbed. Parts of the bank beyond the bend had collapsed, and the newly lo loosened soil was pliant enough to dig my toes into. I had an idea. I ran back to Marika, who was still sitting on the rock. Let's build a den, I said, a hiding place. From what, said Marika? From everything, I wanted to say. From mom and dad, and from Don John the Baptist's head. From the insects in my own head, from, and from the ants that were still crawling through the backs of the cupboards into what was left of the chocolate digestives. Instead, I said, I don't know, nothing in particular. Like our own secret house, you mean, said Marika? Like on the banks of Silver Creek. Brilliant. We ba began by scraping a large hole dug into the side of the bank, patting the walls with our palms until they were as smooth as clay. And over the next few days, we furnished it with rocks and books that we lugged between us across the half mile across the felt in a net potato bag. With kitchen scissors, we cut down the roots that stuck up from the den floor and laid scratchy a scratchy wool wool blanket over the spikes that remained. Gradually, more and more objects began to trickle in, little things from home that our parents wouldn't notice were missing. Egg cups, chipped flower pots, a tarnished brass bell, which we delighted in ringing, cracking the brittle and quiet of the sleeping felt. Marika bought an old army knife she found in a shed, and I bought my Cindy dolls. We turned out to be natural decorators, and the den, both inside and out, quickly began to take a character all of its own standing out from the drab riverbank like a flower on a beach. We hung the entrance with one of Nana Gloria's old gauzy nighties, cutting it down the front to form, form a wobbly rectangle, pulling the lacy cups away from each other and holding them to either side of the entrance roof with the heaviest rocks we could lift, one on each cup. To keep our nighty curtain from sagging, we placed another rock over the middle, at the place between the frayed shoulder straps where once Nana's back had risen, pale and brittle as the moon. Even in the slumberous afternoon heat, the air inside the den was cool, and in the early evenings, when the sinking sun flickered through the nighty curtain, lighting the den walls as if by a million shards of glass, we sat, knee to knee, elbow to elbow on the blanket, and immersed ourselves in the dance. Um... <clears throat> If Mrs. Van Denise wondered where we were on those hot afternoons after instruction, she did not ask. And I brushed off the fact that I was breaking one of Dad's all-important rules. Going out there wasn't even about breaking the rules anymore. 
It had become something else. A tenuous happiness that set me on fire a little inside. The boundaries that had always held my life neatly in place had shifted, and I felt myself teetering on their edges like a tightrope walker, my balance never quite as perfect as I imagined it to be. I've got something for you, whispered Marika after instruction a week before Christmas. It's a Christmas present, but I want to give it to you early. What is it, I said. I'll show you at the den. It's a secret. Ma doesn't know about it. She'd kill me if she did. I thought you'd be interested, though, since you're always asking about this kind of stuff. Where is it? Wait till we get to the den, said Marika. It's in my cupboard. I'll get it, and then we have to run, okay, before Ma sees. She went to her room and came back with a bulging plastic bag. It's not as big as it looks, she said. I wrapped it in my pajamas because I couldn't find wrapping paper. She shrugged, sorry. Inside the den, I opened the pajamas to find a hardback book with a picture of a nearly naked African man on the front, squatting and smoking a pipe. His face was painted black and white and his nose was pierced by two crisscrossed bones. Over one bony shoulder hung a leopard skin. The man's eyes glittered. The book is called An Annotated Pictorial of Southern African Pagan Rituals. I gasped. How did you get this? I thumbed through the pages. Africans throwing chickens in the air. Africans with scarred faces. Two Africans with knives dripping blood from their own arms into a bowl. Africans dancing, naked. The book gave me goosebumps. I was relieved the pictures were in black and white. I stole it, whispered Marika. At my church, they had a thing where everyone brought in symbols of evil, bottles of whiskey, communist pamphlets, Rolling Stones records, that kind of thing, <laughs> and, <laughs> and put them in a box to be buried. You know, like burying your sins. I took this out when no one was looking, but it's okay. Stealing to give to other people isn't proper stealing, and they were only going to bury it anyway, which is a waste. I didn't know what to say. Hide it, said Marika. Keep it here, I don't want your mum to find it. Mum won't mind, I don't think, I said. She'll say it's art, even the disgusting parts. No offence, but your mum's weird, said Marika. No, she's not, I said, irritated. She's been to London. She's seen lots of things, actually. I thought of adding that the picture of John the Baptist's head on a platter was just as disgusting as the pictures in the book, but thought better of it. I hid the book beneath, un, beneath the blanket at the back of the den. Thank you, I said. It was nice of you to steal a book for me. You're welcome, said Marika. She pressed her nose into the nighty curtain, her breath making it billow, then said, Lil, quick, come and look. I moved to the nighty curtain and looked out to see a jackal trotting up the riverbed. Its nose was a quiver, body twitching, as if its senses were worn entirely on the outside in its skin and its fur and on the black tips of its ears. If I had been alone, I would have been afraid of the jackal, but being with Marika in the den made me brave. When it had passed us, we pretended we were sisters and the jackal was our mother. Oh, mum, I whined, where are you? We're starving. Please bring back a nice juicy rabbit. Mama has left us again, said Marika, sighing. It looks like we will have to make do with dung beetle tonight. I fell on the ground laughing, then sat up and looked out again. We had built a pebble path leading out from the nighty curtain to the opposite bank, lining it with bigger rocks and decorating the gaps between them with anything we could find. Feathers, dried grasses, crackly snakeskins that looked like honeycomb, and tin foils squished into flower and star shapes and wrapped around the edge of, ends of twigs. The tin foil twigs looked like magic wands flashing in the low, the low evening sun. The jackal stood just beyond them, one paw up, sniffing the air, as if unsure what to do with itself. Then, as if suddenly remembering something, it sprinted off down the river bank. Oh, sister, I said, Mama is never coming back. We collapsed laughing then. Then Marika said, we could be real sisters, you know. Huh, I said, like blood sisters. I sat up straight, how? Like in the book, said Marika, that picture of the two men. My skin boiled. We can't do that, I said. Why not, said Marika. We don't have to completely bleed to death like those freakadelic bushmen. Blood's mobile. It's alive. It squiggles together. Sisters, I said. Exactly. I feel like you're my sister. 
Trust me, I'm more of a friend to you than your little Sifo is. My heart jumped a little when she said that, but I didn't say anything because I could never get her to understand about Sifo and me. So how about it, Marika said. How do we do it? With Pa's knife, I'll show you. Hold out your hand. It sounded dangerous. I couldn't get the picture in the book out of my mind. Marika reached behind her and pulled an army knife out of a nook we had carved into the den wall. I shook my head. I felt suddenly small and confused in the red growing night. I edged away from Marika and stared at the bleary bank on the other side of the nighty curtain. What's wrong? Uh-uh, I said. Marika sighed. Look, Lil, you're pretty much stuck out here just the same as me, so you might as well watch out for each other. This just makes it more official, that's all. Like a pact. It means no matter what, we stick by each other. That's what sisters do.